Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Thank you for having me. All right, so is it true that you were once booed at Turner Field, and that's why the Braves moved north? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's a correlation. I've never confirmed it, uh, but it is true. I tried to throw a ball to some kids, and I just, like, totally missed them, and everyone thought I was – it was so bad, everyone thought I did it on purpose. So, was, you know, I'll never forget it. Uh, unfortunately. And then, of course, I had to remind you of it. Yeah, way to go. Great host. <laughs> no, uh, I'm proud of it. It's, who gets to get booed? Very few people. <laughs> that's right. So I know, uh, I know for me – uh, now, I haven't had the basketball experience yet of getting back until uh, like a couple, three weeks from now. But in the football experience, after announcing games in empty stadiums last year, which I did, I'm now doing games with 100,000 plus, and it's totally different. What's it been like for you to cover games again with fans and stands? It's awesome. I mean, I'm the first day I got to do that was at Yankee Stadium on opening day, and there were only like 10,000 people, and I, you know, it felt like there were 100,000. It was, it was one of those things where you get chills and you're like, wow, it's amazing that we just got to do this for years and we never appreciated it for what it is. It's, it's so special, and it's really amazing that, that we're back doing it. We know what the perception was of the Houston Astros two years ago, and they were able to get through last season with no issue because there was nobody there to boo them. By getting there now five consecutive years, you know, whether, you know, division title and now getting to another World Series, are they changing their perception nationally or is that still hanging over them? You know, I think that there's always going to be a really vocal, potentially minority, maybe majority, who are going to hold the cheating against them for a really long time. Um, I think naturally you're always going to be suspicious of what comes after something like that. Um, but I think what they're showing is like the real tragedy of it all is that they never really needed sign stealing to be one of the best hitting teams, right. you know, of this generation. I mean, they're they're loaded. They have an AL batting title winner hitting seventh right now, and <laughs> you can't argue with it. You know, it's they're so good. And I think, you know, from what I hear from people around the game, the changes that MLB has made to monitor for the kind of stealing signs that the Astros did make it very hard to do that again. I mean, it doesn't mean they're not doing anything doesn't mean other teams haven't figured out other ways but you know it, they're not doing what they were doing and I think that they have proven that without doing that they are just as prolific offensively and so to get back to this point this many years in a row is a huge achievement and I think if they win one now a few years removed different coaches largely different players other than the big kind of few in the infield um, they'll shed as much of it as they can shed it'll always be there but you know, all they can sort of do is prove that they can do it without it. And, you know, I think they're kind of well on their way to doing that. And the batting champ she's referring to is Yuri Gurriel, who is a pro's pro hitter. Man, he is a pro at the plate. Um, yeah. Yeah, so let's get to, obviously, the pitching part of this. We know how a regular season plays out. We also know how analytics play out. Uh, watching the number of moves that people are making. Is it, in your opinion, and that, and you, you can kind of judge by words and how they use, are they doing this because, look, it's the postseason, short leash, no matter what, first sign of trouble, we move? Or are they doing it so they can explain later, well, he was in trouble, so I made a move? You know, it's, it does sort of make sense for each individual move. I think you're seeing starters kind of get pulled really early. I think in the past, I think one of the, there's two things at play. I think, I think one starting pitchers are exhausted right now. Um, you know, they are certainly used to pitching, you know, a full season of innings, but they didn't do it last year. And anyone in player development will tell you that, you know, you never want to put anyone's arm through an innings jump that is, you know, even 50% more than the innings they threw last year, let alone three times the number of innings. So you're just seeing, guys being more tired. And I think that like sort of the new development, as Dusty Baker said yesterday, is is now if a starter is struggling, you don't play the long game. You don't watch him and say, you know what? We need to save our bullpen for game four. You assume that if you have a chance to win this game, if it's not out of hand, you have to play to win that game. And that's sort of the conventional wisdom now. And so, um, you know, I think you're seeing a lot of moves on starters early. The patience isn't there. 
whether that's right or wrong, it certainly can be annoying to people. But, um, you know, it's just kind of a part of things right now. I don't know how long that'll stay. I think there will be talks about ways to sort of, you know, ensure starters staying the game longer. But, you know, I think like in a vacuum, each of the moves makes some sense. But it's just a different approach and it slows the game down and, and you kind of wish they didn't have to be made. So I, you know, I think it's going to have to be kind of a structural change to, to eliminate that, but it's, it certainly makes these games drag more than they potentially need to. Well, it's interesting about that. It, let's, let's have a little fun with this for a moment. It's interesting how you can win 95 games doing it one way, or in the Braves case, I think it was 88 and enough to get you here. And now you completely change how you play once you get there. <laughs> that's what yes. I find is so interesting. You somehow, some way under the old way, won 95 games and 88. And now it's not good enough. That's what I always find interesting about this. It is fascinating. And I think, like, whether or not that is a bad thing is something that I've never decided. Because it, is it more fun that it's kind of wild this time of year and a free-for-all and everybody's available and all this stuff? Like, you know, I, I don't know, but it's certainly true. And I think um, more and more, like, the regular season is moving this way, too, which is why you sort of have to adjust. You know, I know one thing that's been on the table, you know, Max Scherzer, the you know, Cy Young kind of winner guy, he, uh, as we all know, he he wants to tie the DH to the starting pitcher, right? So you get a DH as long as your starter's in the game. Right. As soon as you pull him, you know, then you have to pinch hit and stuff. So stuff like that. There's got to be incentives to sort of keep guys in. But it is crazy that, that how much things change this time of year. And it makes it really hard to build a roster to win a World Series. I mean, Alex Anthopoulos of the Braves the other night, who has obviously built a team that went to the World Series, said, I still have no idea how to build a team that gets to the World Series. Because it, it just gets random. Right? Things get weird. And, you know, it's it's really strange. I think that's fun in some ways. But I think it's also maddening to people who, you know, look at a team built to win, you know, 105, 106 games, and neither of those teams is in the World Series. Exactly. Yeah, exactly right. Uh is there anything hanging over this World Series because on midnight December 1st, the collective bargaining agreement is up? I think so. Um, you know, it's it's tense. I think that that's going to be the story of the offseason, unfortunately. Um, you know, both sides kind of say the right things about being optimistic about getting something done by December 1st. I don't see how that happens. It might not necessarily bleed into the next season, but there's just a lot of issues. There's a lot of big-time frustrations that the players have. The owners don't think there's that much wrong, and and so that clash is going to be substantial. And, you know, this is a sport that needs to broaden its audience. It needs to find a way to sort of re-entrench itself in places where it's lost ground. And to have labor issues steal even some of the intrigue of the offseason, but certainly any of the regular season, I think would be hugely problematic. And I, I think that people realize that. I think there is an understanding that you can't afford, especially after the losses of COVID, to shut things down for any substantial length of time. But, you know, the people who negotiate these things, they have they have a lot on the line. They have personal things on the line. They have, you know, frustration in play. And uh, I'm not sure how it'll all go, but it's, it's a scary time, I think. I, I don't think, I think this is a big one. I think whether they kick the can down the road or not, you know, there's some, some big kind of clashes looming there. And what's interesting about it is, I, I'd like to get your gauge since you're there every day, because, I mean, it, uh, I felt like the last two months of the season with everybody opening up the gates, because some people had limited time, you know, in terms of when they opened up fully and so forth. I felt like the last couple of months they were really gaining some momentum with the game and the fan. Did you get that sense, too? I did. And their ratings were really good early in the postseason, you know, compared to what they normally are. There was real excitement. I think they, you know, suffered for, you know, a lot of their big stars kind of not being able to make it to the playoffs. But I still, the games were really good. I mean, everything's been good. Whether you like the Astros and the Braves being in the World Series, the, the drama has been there. And, you know, there is momentum. They have hugely marketable stars in Fernando Tatis, Shohei Otani, these names that weren't on the radar a couple of years ago. Um, that they can do something with and to, you know, I think it always just boils down to the perception that these negotiations are rich guys arguing over money that none of us will ever have. And, you know, to let that win out over momentum that they need, they they have to capitalize on, I think would be obviously a mistake and and sort of unconscionable. Uh, America got to see Juan Soto play. 
a couple of years ago and loved watching him play. They're missing out on Ronald Acuna Jr. this time through because of the injury he suffered back around the 4th of July. What does it tell us about the Braves that they're in this spot without having a great player like that in the lineup for almost three months? You know, I think my first instinct is is that they'll be back. Um, You know, I think they're going to be able to add a starter or two and pop in an MVP candidate like Ronald Acuna Jr. and and be formidable in a division that is not formidable. So, you know, they're not going to have to, you know, really grind their way through a regular season. Um, So, you know, I think they'll be back. I think Anthopoulos knows what he's doing. You know, he has admitted that he got lucky at the trade deadline. He acquired a bunch of outfielders and all of them kind of fit and worked and produced which doesn't always happen. Um, but I think he, he is a guy who seems to uh, kind of have a good feel for, for how to do this. He seems to have learned lessons from failure in the past. And, um, you know, I think they're pretty well set to, to be around for a while, much like those teams of the, of the 90s. You know, I think these Braves might have a half decade, decade in them of, of postseason runs. And it's interesting because, I mean, obviously in the 90s with the big three, especially on the mound, right? they could roll out you know anybody they wanted whenever they wanted. You felt like, well, they got a shot tonight. Uh, for Houston, uh, Correa, his, his contract's up, uh, for example. Uh, do they have a chance at continued longstanding, or is this where the economics of baseball will start to unravel them a little bit? You know, I think they're gonna they're gonna unravel a little bit. I think Correa expects to go elsewhere. Um, you know, they'll keep Bregman and Altuve. Obviously, they've got Jordan Alvarez, who people should know. He's an incredible <laughs> He's, hitter. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, look, I'm a Red Sox fan. Okay, that's where I grew up. Yeah, was yeah. in New England. You know. <laughs> okay, so no offense, but like, yeah, you know, when you're hitting five thousand in the playoffs, I think he's pretty good. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah, just they're, they're loaded. Kyle Tucker is going to be an elite hitter. I mean, they're they're just you know dripping with offensive talent. They've got a lot of young starters who've now thrown a lot of postseason innings. Like, I don't think they're going away, but I think Correa is is at the heart of a lot of what they do, a lot of their swagger, and it'll be interesting to see how they choose to replace him. You know, there's plenty of big name free agents out there. Maybe they get a deal done. He doesn't seem to think like he'll be there uh, long term, but. You know, I I don't even know what they do with Dusty Baker, which sounds absurd after he leads them to a World Series. Yeah. But you know, he's not your traditional kind of new age manager, and they might want somebody like that. So it's it's going to be an interesting time. But they're not going anywhere soon. They're just going to kind of have to rework what they've got. I think. Yeah, well, that's interesting uh, because you're right. How do you rework it, especially after you're like this? Because it's always a temptation. You know this, where especially if the team wins it. There's this attachment to not want to get rid of players, and you and mm-hmm. I both know that's not always <laughs> the way, the way yeah. it's supposed to work out. A hundred percent. I mean, the Nationals, for example, give Steven Strasburg a massive extension. They didn't yeah. want to let him go, but that was a sentimental decision and, and not a baseball one. You know, they knew as well as anybody, if not better, that he would probably get hurt again, and, and he has, and he hasn't pitched. I think he's maybe won one game since the end of the 2019 World Series. So. You can't get caught in those deals, and the, and the Cubs didn't do it. You know, the Cubs took a lot of you know stuff for letting Rizzo and Bryant um, go, but they they didn't want to overpay, and they didn't do it. And you know, we'll see what what comes of that. But uh, I do think sentiment gets in the way. You know, the Astros have been a team that's really been pretty numbers based, but you know, these guys are beloved there: Correa, Altuve, Bregman, and oh, yeah. um, there'll be there'll be a lot of pressure to keep them around. I feel like Houston's become a baseball town. All those years of being a football town, then maybe the Rockets, I feel like they're a baseball town now. They certainly seem like it. I mean, they have some of the best crowds in the game, as much as people don't want to hear it. I mean, they're loud. They know what's going yeah. on. Like, they're they're into it. Yeah. Chelsea, it was an absolute pleasure. I, and when, yeah. when, when it goes to Atlanta, they'll cheer you. I'll make- <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chelsea. Great, great conversation.